Mike had a good question. What can you share regarding working with elected and appointed officials regarding leadership? Oh, yeah, man. We're definitely going to talk about that because those are um, uh, that that's one of the populations you know you have to work with uh, when you're in emergency management. Um, and it's it, it's interesting because uh, the research and my experience is that it's sometimes easier to work with elected officials than it is some of the professional folks, the fire department people and the police department people. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, working with those folks. Uh, Ariel has, all right, Ariel's in Columbia. Great, Ariel, I'm right down the street and I'm in Charleston tonight. So uh, I'll be driving through Columbia tomorrow. Do have a question, I'm working on my bachelor's now. What are things I should aim to do while in school? Oh, excellent. And uh, actually, Tammy, I might have you address that one because I know you've gone through a number of internships and a, a number of different paths to get where you are. Yeah, uh, I took a very windy road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the biggest thing that I can say is find a way to gain some type of experience. Volunteer, intern, do as much as you can to gain experience because when you graduate in those... Uh, entry level positions say must have three to five years experience. They don't necessarily mean paid experience. They just want you to understand what is actually going on. See if you can volunteer in your county EOC or city EOC, see if you can volunteer with some organizations, um, see if there's some internship opportunities. I know there's a lot of virtual ones, especially because of COVID out there. Um, there's some, you know, your community has an in-person one that's definitely helpful, but that would be my biggest thing is try to gain as much experience as you can put into writing. Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks, Jorge. Um, that's a great point with experience. And also, if you can start, um, as, as one of my colleagues likes to say, collecting certifications. So if you can get some certifications under your belt, um, even if they're just joining a CERT team, okay, a community, energy, a community emergency response team that has a training uh, involved in it, your CPR certification, your first aid. Um, for where I live in South Carolina, uh, search and rescue is a really big thing. So we're all getting certified in wilderness first aid. Um, and that demonstrates to employers that you have great depth in, um, in emergency management, but also you've been out, you know what's going on, you have a little bit more experience than some other candidates. So getting that type of experience, getting those type of certificates, um, which can be really helpful um, is, uh, is a good idea. Sarah asked, do you think going for EMT is beneficial? Absolutely, absolutely. I have my EMT. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I was, I was signed up for EMT and uh, my employer really didn't like the idea that I was going to take six weeks off. Um, so uh, we're, we're looking at a different thing. Would a PMP well, certification help? Oh, yeah. I, I got to tell you, a PMP certification will help. Oh, yeah. Anything. Okay. That's, that's a really premier certification and hard to get. So we're going to go ahead and actually get started. Um, thank you, everyone who's here for joining us. Uh, my name is Tammy Snedeker. I'm the uh, initiative leader for Emergency Management Growth Initiative. Um, unfortunately, Lorraine, our founder, is unable to be here today uh, with all the flooding. Uh, she works for the Walt Disney World Company, the whole like management, not the little individual parks. But as a whole, they did have some things that she has to deal with, with all the major flooding from Hurricane Ida. So she has not had a chance to stop today. Um, so she is working and regrets that she can't be here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just kind of talk a little bit about us. Emergency Management Growth Initiative was started to help those that are looking to get into the field of emergency management. Um, I know it's an extremely difficult field to get into. Uh, for those of you that were kind of listening just now, my very windy path took me 10 years to get my first full-time paid position. Um, it really shouldn't be that hard in a community where we have constantly open positions. So part of one of the things that we're trying to do here is make the field of emergency management more accessible and more attainable to the next generation. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Clemson Terragano and uh, let him tell you, tell everyone about his background. 
Oh, no, thanks, Tammy. And, and welcome, everybody, and welcome to our international participants. Um, my name is Clemson Terragano, and I'm really excited to be uh, working with the uh, Emergency Manager Growth Initiative. It's something that's really important to me, and it's something I've been engaged with for a number of years in a number of different ways. And so today, um, we're going to be talking about a couple of things. I, I, as, I, as I go through this introduction a little bit, I'd like you to have in the back of your mind, why, why is this important to you, okay, and what might be helpful uh, as we go through this? Because we're going to be talking about why is leadership important? Why is leadership and emergency management one of the most critical skills that you can perfect as an emergency manager? What do you, you know, what do you need to be a good emergency manager leader? And then we're going to talk a little bit about who am I leading and then how do I lead? And we're going to give you some different ideas about what leadership is, but we're going to talk about something very unique. And we're going to talk about collaborative leadership because as an emergency manager, you'll find out, and Tammy, you'll have to correct me if, I, if, 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 if I'm not saying this right, you're really not in charge of anything, but you're responsible for everything, okay? And we're going to talk about what I mean by that statement, okay? So be thinking about why is this important to you, all right? Um, real quick about me, um, I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a career Army officer, uh, retired. I was a tank officer, and when I wasn't running around with tanks, I was um, teaching at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point or at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, I helped begin a, uh, an organization that is similar to EMGI, and we call it the Consortium for Humanitarian Service and Education. And it's an organization that uh, runs disaster simulations, primarily for graduates and undergraduates that are looking for uh, emergency management positions. That's where Tammy and I met, as Tammy is a graduate of one of our uh, HOPE exercises. And Tammy, you're Atlanta HOPE, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Tammy went through our humanitarian disaster exercise um, a few years ago. I've been doing uh, global leadership development and have uh, done leadership development in 42 nations around the world. And right now I'm in Charleston because I'm the leadership professor of practice at the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina. I'm also a senior consultant to the Center for Creative Leadership. And going back to the importance of certifications, you got to walk the walk. So I am a CERT and South Carolina Emergency Management uh, Certified Search and Rescue um, Search and Rescue Official, and I've got a few uh, few degrees from different places. My my PhD is in American government. Uh, my master's in political science. I've got a master's in public administration and a master's from the Army War College. But all of that is focused on leadership and. How do we lead, not just as emergency managers, but as emergency managers in disaster situations? That's a really different environment. So I'm curious, and I need your help. Um, if you would put into chat, um, why, why, is it, why are you here tonight? What is, you know, why is this discussion important to you? One or two sentences, one sentence is fine. You could just put in there, I'm really curious. Um, and, uh, and it's something you'd like to leave with. What would you like to leave this discussion tonight with? We're only going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A after that. But if you would, put in the chat uh, what you'd like to leave with and why, you, you know, why you're here this evening, what you'd like to get out of. Finishing education EM, absorbing as much info as you can. Now, thanks, Christina. That's super. And we had something from Angel up there. I'm reading that. Yep. Different viewpoint and leadership, dealing with a different audience. Hey, John, we're definitely going to talk about a different perspective on leadership. Um, and it's a, it's a perspective that uh, we know works really effectively uh, in emergency management. Uh, working in master's in IO psych. Oh, there you go. We're going to see you in the leadership field, Camilo. Camilo, um, several years in EM. Yep. Oh, let me go up. There we are, different viewpoint. Response and preparedness, more integrated vision. Keep in mind that integration because that's what emergency managers do. They integrate 
resources to address a disaster, to address a situation. And just so you know, the situation may be a disaster. The situation may also be your budget for the next year is as the emergency manager, you're gonna to have to integrate other people's resources to make things happen for you. Working 24, oh, you work in NCEM, I take their classes. That's great, Lauren. Want to advance in career, interested in co-op and planning section? Yep, absolutely. Definitely gonna be integrating. Here to learn, hopefully get some guidance on next steps, growth and leadership, perfect. Uh, G Madera works for an agency, hope to expand perspective on the subject, okay, of emergency management leadership. Uh, just getting in your first job as EM, um, as a career in EMS, yeah. Um, yeah, Samantha, we're going to be talking a, a, a lot about how you can be successful as an emergency manager. And a lot of it is understanding your role as a leader within the number of agencies that address a disaster. So I want to thank you very much for providing this information, finishing the master's in two weeks. Congratulations. Want to go from EMS to EM? Perfect. Better understanding a leader. <laughs> oh, Timothy. Oh, Tim, I want to tell you, you made my day. And I know that Tammy uh, did a transition from military to EM on another program with, uh, with actually my, my, the best man for my wedding, General Mark Corson, um, is that uh, better understanding the leadership difference between leading military members versus emergency volunteers. Um, yeah, that's like, that's, that's like leading apples and triangles. Okay. <laughs> they are, um, because a volunteer never has to do anything you say. Um, and you can't make them, uh, and leveraging their motivation for being there is absolutely critical. So we'll talk some more about that. Preparing for the future. Want to get different perspectives. Awesome. Uh, ah, thank you. John made it. Remove the indicated thinking in a changing environment. And uh, like, no, definitely want to network more. So that's really helpful. I've got another, that's really helpful. And thank you very much for sharing those thoughts with me. Um, but why is leadership so important in emergency management? We're all here to talk about leadership, but I'd like to get your thoughts on why like leadership is important. And oh, by the way, we'd love to hear your voice. So if you raise your hand, um, Tammy can bring you off of mute, and we'd love to hear your voice as well. But I'd like to get you know two or three voices in the room about why is leadership so important in emergency management. So feel free to put your hand up. We've got one hand up. There we go. It looks like Josh and John. John, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, I want to get an idea of the different leadership capabilities I'm able to do. 14 years in the military, uh, leading many mil uh, medical personnel is one thing. Civilian is another thing. I teach at a college as an adjunct in EMS studies. So I lead a lot of people. I have run a lot of classes, uh, but getting a different component of, of doing different type of leadership with other personnel or directs in an emergency management uh, is a little bit different. And I want to get a different perspective of that. I uh, used to be a, a supervisor and I ran 150 ambulances of personnel daily. Again, that's different working in a disaster type thing. And I want to get a different component. That's what I was saying. I want a different audience uh, because when you work with all EMS people, you all want to try to do one thing. But when you're different, working in a different community, you had different viewpoints, volunteers, other people, like you said, the, the, the volunteer, I'm a lifetime member in a volunteer organization. And I understand very much of, I don't have to do this. I'm not getting paid for it. Add another zero. And you try to get them to do what you're trying to do the same component. So that's the thing I'm looking for for a different leadership and emergency management, what I can do. And I'm in a, also in a process of uh, hopefully getting a new job of um, actually a local health emergency coordinator. And this will probably help me a lot uh, if I get that job <laughs> that way. <laughs> no, John, I'm going to add one more thing to that. And that is, uh, you're familiar with the incident control system, right? Oh, yes. Uh, Okay, so then you know about the um, incident commander and yes. the incident commander can shift and that the incident commander may not be the most experienced person on the site. Fact. <laughs> okay, and you and I both know from our military experience, that's very different from what happens in the military. Okay, right. and that 
the incident commander in the military can kind of order people to do things. Well, the incident commander in, uh, in a disaster situation uh, can make some really strong suggestions. And depending on a number of different things that we're going to hit on tonight, um, they may or may not be able to address that disaster in, in a very streamlined way. So the biggest thing about the difference between the military side and the uh, civilian side is although there is a hierarchy, it is not as authoritative or as structured as anything either in the military or even in the police or fire departments, even within EMS. It's much looser and requires relationships. And if there's one thing I'd like you to walk out of here with tonight is the importance of relationships and building relationships and your network. Somebody mentioned earlier about, hey, building my network is really important. It is. And building, yeah, thanks, Camilo. You're spot on, man. Is, um, or woman, I'm not sure. Uh, Camilo, I'm, 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 I'm going to take a wild guess at that. But relationships are really critical. Is, and you want to have relationships with everyone you might link up with at a disaster site. Um, one of the things that uh, I thought um, uh, our local emergency manager did very effectively was we got in a group of new CERT people to be trained on CERT, right? And what he did is he brought in um, not the chief of police. He brought in the, uh, the watch officer from the fire department, from the police department, the EMS supervisor, and so that they could talk about what they did. And then afterwards, you know, he had a, he had a coffee clutch and we all just talked just to build those relationships. So when you get to a disaster, it's not the first time you're meeting those people. And then it builds the trust that makes disaster response effective. The biggest challenge in disaster response is not knowing who's literally on the ground and not trusting that they're doing the right thing. You as a leader need to build that trust before that disaster happens. I hope that's helpful for you, John. That's a, that's a great comment and I appreciate that. I think Joshua had a comment too about why yep. leadership's important. Joshua can go now. Yes, um, it's actually Joshua. So uh, J.O. from John, oh, S.H.A. from Sharon. I apologize. So, oh, you're <laughs> right. Look at that I, I get it all the time. I, it's not the first time, I promise. Um, so I work currently as a paramedic. I have worked on incident management teams um, in Charlotte and the way that I was able to get involved with that was actually through the taking classes and developing my relationships around the state. Um, I'm currently in EMS looking to expand my career into emergency management. So I think one of the big things, um, like, like it's already been said, is that the relationship building um, and bringing outside experience into emergency management's been very key. Um, for me, I, prior to working in EMS, I've also worked as an HR manager and a restaurant manager. So you've got your salesmanship, which kind of comes into like the authority portion versus like the responsibility versus authority person. Um, yep. When you're trying to, you know, like you said, manage other people's money and, and deal with all that stuff. You know, if you can sell your, your product, which is your EOP or whatever it happens to be, um, that really helps people when you can show them what their value is going to be for them giving you that responsibility or that authority over that particular agency or on, on certain um, aspects. So I've learned that um, from that side. And I think with EMS, like having worked in EMS as long as I have, one of the big things that I've learned with emergency management um, and the leadership is that when you have an opportunity to kind of stay focused and show that things can go well, then things generally go well. Um, it's, you know, Absolutely. the attitude kind of thing. So. Well, it is a lot of attitude, but also what I'm hearing is something that's really important, and that is recognizing the value of everyone who comes in. And it kind of goes back to John's question of how do we lead volunteers is recognize their value. Um, the, again, uh, one of the people that I work with on our search and rescue team, um, he's, very, he's very clear. He says, I don't, I don't know how to use drones. He goes, I'm not a drone person but I have really smart people who help me understand that and who do drones. I'm not a ham radio guy, but we have people who do ham radio. So anytime we do either a mock SAR or a, uh, or a real SAR, he invites all of those people. 
And we've had some terrific luck, uh, not only now with airborne drones, but now we're working with drones that actually go into lakes and go under the water and search for people. So he's someone who recognized the value uh, of people and what they bring to the fight, even if they can't walk through the woods. And like you're saying, Josh, uh, recognizing that value and putting that value to work is how you retain volunteers. And when they find out that they're valued, they go out and get more volunteers. So Joshua, thank you very much for your thoughts, because one of the reasons that when we talk about leadership is important in emergency management has to do with a couple of definitions that come from uh, IAM and, uh, and, and FEMA, is if you look at these definitions, we're going to get academic for just a second, is just look at the definition and read that. I'm going to let you read it. I'm not going to read it to you. So that's the definition of emergency management. Here's the vision for emergency management. And this is all agreed on by all these agencies. And then here's the mission for emergency management. So take a quick look through that. There's a lot of language in those things. And what I did, I was looking at that and said, okay, I, where's the leadership in this? So I looked at the definition and I recognized that the leadership words are in yellow, creating, reduce, cope. The management words are in green. We got to manage, we got framework, we got communities. So management is all about things. Leadership is all about interacting with people. When you look at the vision statement that is agreed on by all of these agencies, same thing. Yellow is the leadership, green is the management. Seeks, promote, and cope. Management is all about vulnerable communities and building capacity, capacities, you know, training and structure and things like that. What really got me when I was looking at the mission though, right? I'm looking at the mission and there's a lot of management, very little leadership. Protects, coordinates, and integrates. Protects, coordinates, and integrates. To build, sustain, improve, mitigate, prepare, respond to, recover. All of that's planning. All of that is management. But the leadership piece is where you will spend 80 to 90% of your time in protecting, coordinating, and integrating different resources to make all those other things happen. That's what the emergency manager really does. And this, uh, these three things were agreed on by all of these agencies, okay? FEMA, IAEM, the Emergency Managers Association, uh, NEMA, EMAP, all of them. And the interesting thing that struck me is how little leadership they reflect, but how much leadership they depend on. Because they're saying, you got to do these things. And you know what? Here's what's going to happen. For I, I saw earlier that we have a lot of people that want to move into emergency management. You're going to be a wicked good manager, okay? Because there's a lot of terrific training out there. Uh, Tammy works for an organization that does it. I work uh, as a volunteer for an organization that does it. But they're not going to train you in leadership. They're not going to train you in the things that you need to know to cooperate, coordinate, integrate, create, reduce, or cope with all of the different resources in order to address a disaster simulation. And that's one of the reasons that um, in our CHSC and the consortium that we work in, we actually have two sides to everything that we do. As the first side is the skill building. We want you to have the skill and the management. But then after you practice that skill, we have a leadership conversation about how did you go through that? What's best for you? How do you best create, reduce, cope, seek, promote, protect, coordinate, and integrate? The reason we do that is because there's so many people engaged in emergency management. So just looking at this picture, just looking at this picture, all right? And you can put your answers into chat. Um, how many different communities do you think you have to integrate just to make that casualty move in, in a disaster. How many different communities do you see in this picture? Go ahead and just put your answers into chat. There 
There's three, four, maybe more, five. Okay, three. If anybody wants to put their hand off, come off mute. I'd love to know what three you're looking at. One is easily identifiable. We got the State National Guard out there. Um, at least five. Thank you, Keila. I hope I said your name right. Uh, Ariel, I see military, EMS, there's fire. Uh, doesn't include public or hospital systems, but it does because what we have is, let me just go through these with you real fast, is we have, there we go. I don't know why this takes so long. There we go. First of all, we have the state. That blue building was actually a hospital that was owned by FEMA that then um, they never put up, but because we said we do it in our exercise, they said, oh, well, go ahead and uh, we'll provide you everything and we'll have somebody out there to help you. You've got the American Red Cross. You've got the city EMS that's owned by the city. You have a district EMS that's owned outside of the city by a district that is in a co-op relationship with the hospital. You've got the casualty. A lot of people forget about the casualties. They are a group that you have to work with. Oh, and you probably can't see it real well, but back here, you actually have the press that's in there that is talking to some volunteers as well as an elected official. And so you have a number of different communities that you're going to have to cooperate and integrate with uh, to make disaster relief and disaster response happen. And you've got a number of different communities that you're gonna have to work with. And as we looked at this and as we looked through some of the uh, research and some of the literature, We've identified six major, um, six major communities. The first one is your team. So when you're an emergency manager, you're going to have a team that's working with you, and you're going to have to work with them. You have the disaster casualties. You'd be amazed how many people forget about the casualties. But you know what? They are a critical component of the decisions that you're making as a leader. You have the disaster professionals. Those are your professionals. Some of you are EMSs. You fall right into that. You have the fire department. You have the police department. In some cases, uh, the National Guard, when acting as a state entity, could fall into that as well. Then you have the volunteers, that American Red Cross van that, in the middle of our exercise, drove up. This, this is how it happened. We're doing an exercise. Van drives up with American Red Cross. Would you like us to help? <laughs> We're like, sure. What do you do? Well. We're there for morale and uh, we have coffee and we have, uh, we have coffee and we have snacks and we have blankets if somebody gets cold because it was, it looks warm there, but it was actually chilly later on. Um, and we just help. We're like, oh, okay. They go, where do you want us? We said right here. And yeah, we ended up with the Red Cross there, disaster volunteers, elected officials. Um, yeah, elected officials, uh, we talked earlier about uh, different challenging populations you're going to be working with. Um, believe it or not, fire and police uh, and EMS are, are not the most, uh, can be challenging when it comes to who's going to be the incident commander and what type of incident is it. Elected officials are not trained for any of this, and they don't consider, um, they, they, it's not something that they really think a lot about. Um, a friend of mine is uh, uh, a mayor here in uh, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and he posted on his Facebook, he said, oh, we had this disaster thing, and I had to be the incident commander. Now, he and I went to the Citadel together, and so he's, he's used to being, you know, in charge and everything else like that, but he was like, I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea what to do, and like Camilo says, egos get in the way of progress and success. And when that ego is combined to one of these different communities, that can be a significant challenge. And then you have uh, perhaps my favorite um, group, and that's the media. Um, and a lot of people will get upset when the press shows up, but hey, the press has a job. And if you recognize that the press has a role and the press has a job, and you have your talking points right, you can really have a good relationship with them. If you know what's going on, you know how to answer questions, you know how to engage with the press, and you built a relationship with them before the incident, you're going to be golden, okay? You're going to be better. 
The press is going to report whatever it wants. It just is. Getting upset about it means that between you and the press, one of you is upset, okay? But if you have your talking points right and you've established a relationship and you have a trusting relationship with uh, that member of the media, yeah, that can be a really, really positive for your entire emergency management team and your disaster response. So we got to get all of these people working together. And how do we do that? Uh, how do we give you as emergency managers the skills that are necessary to do that, that difference between a military skill and a civilian skill? Um, and incidentally, this is, uh, this is from one of our exercises. This wonderful person was a, um, is a family nurse practitioner who was working as an emergency room nurse talking to our uh, member of the media and giving him outstanding uh, talking points. Um, had to put that uh, in there, Tammy, because uh, that is my, uh, that's my daughter-in-law and my son uh, out at Missouri Hope. And uh, my son was a communication major. He would come out and play the press for us. And he was a tough press guy. And I think she's the only person I've seen smiling when he was interviewing him. So um, got to build that relationship before the disaster happens. So when we look at what are our tools for integration and coordination, we mentioned one, that's building relationships. When we talk about leadership, we talk about what are your competencies or capabilities? What are you good at? What do you need to be good at to be an effective leader in emergency management? And the Blanchard Company did a whole bunch of research in 2006 that came up with 10 competencies. Uh, Springer, who was another academic, came up with 14 competencies. The uh, International Association of Emergency Managers has nine principles that are important for you. You can look all those up. But really, um, you need four key things to be an effective leader, okay? And this can be an effective leader in emergency management or a CEO of a major corporation. And these four things are the four we call lead for success. And they are basically self-awareness. First, know who you are. You lead from the inside out. You don't lead from the outside in. You may have all the structure in the world. You may understand the incident command system. You may know how to run a command post, but you know what? If you don't know who you are, you're not gonna be an effective leader. You need to have learning agility and learning agility is the ability to see things in a different way. The ability not only to influence, but to be influential. This is one of the most important criteria for uh, women leaders, is having that influence and having that sense of authority. You know, guys already, you know, guys just want to mix it up and usually screw it up when they do it. Women, however, have a tendency to not be as assertive. And so there's a wonderful book called Kicking Some Glass, Kicking Some Glass by Portia Mount. Um, and it's a wonderful book about building your influence and also being influential with other people, understanding what's important to them, just like uh, we were talking about earlier, we're understanding the value of that volunteer and leveraging that value. And then the ability to communicate. So within each of these, Within self-awareness, um, believe it or not, you're going to laugh when I say this. And if you haven't taken this test, okay, um, I'd encourage you to do it. Red Bull has a wonderful self-assessment about what you're strong at. And it's called, Red, uh, it's called Red Bull Wings. If you go on their website, believe it or not, I, I, it's a wonderful assessment. It's one of the best that's out there. It will give you some excellent insight about what you're strong at. And it's a lot of fun to take. It does take about an hour to complete because it's a very thorough assessment, but it will give you some idea about who you are and how you like to lead. The other thing you wanna find out is get a mentor and find out how other people experience you. When I come across, how do I come across? Do I come across as mean, arrogant, concerned, um, not assertive, unknowing? And you can do this with a mentor, you can do this with a trusted peer, you can do this with your teammates. But if you don't do this, all right, you are, you're, you're, you're not gonna be as effective as a leader. 
learning agility is all about what you want and why. All right, because you're going to go for what you want. And I saw that in some of the earlier comments. And that's so powerful. Hey, I want to be an EM. Awesome. All I'd ask is if we were having a coaching conversation, I'd ask you why. Okay, why do you want that? Because that gives you energy to go after your career. Another key thing, especially today, is understanding your bias. All right. Um, and I really appreciate John's comments about the military and civilian. I can tell he has a military bias. So do I. Okay. I have a Southern bias. I have an American bias. When I go overseas, I know that about myself and I try to make other people aware that, yeah, that might be a limitation on my part. Also might be a strength, but understanding your bias and then your critical thinking skills. As an emergency manager, remember I said, you know, you might not have the authority to do anything, but the responsibility for everything. Yeah, there's going to be a time where that elected official looks to you and says, what should we be doing right now? And you're going to have to think very critically, understand not only emergency management, but also how does fire, police, EMS, volunteers, uh, state elected officials all fit in to the response effort. That's where the critical thinking becomes so important. So honing your critical thinking skills, thinking about things in a different perspective is critical to learning agility. Influence, what's your reputation? Goes back to relationships, and we've talked about that. What's your education? Talked about getting those certifications, also getting that experience. And not just getting the academic certification, but showing that you have the experience to do it. And then finally, as an emergency manager, those relationships and those communication loops, being open. Not only providing people feedback, but asking people for their feedback as well. Best way to open communication. Another great way to do open communication is to do uh, after action reviews, as well as you know, another, another thing that people are starting to use now is post event reviews. Doing those and making them mandatory. Can you hear me thumping the desk, making them mandatory and doing it in an open way. Oh man, you're going to have people that want to talk because they need to process through what happened. And you're going to find out who your strong performers are and also what people need to know. Another thing I put in here for communication is, is we, 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 we hang around with people that are like us, okay? And pay attention to who you hang around with and why you're hanging around with them. And then how do you prefer to communicate with others? And the reason you want to look at those four things, just four things, self-awareness, learning agility, influence, communication, is that whether you recognize it or not, whether you want to accept it or not, as an emergency manager, as someone with a certificate, as someone with experience in emergency manager, you're engaged in the process of leadership. People are going to ask you a question. When someone asks you a question, they're making you the teacher. They're making you the leader. They want to follow your answer. And so as you think about yourself as a leader, you can think about yourself as a position that is a leader. You can think of yourself as providing information. That's a leader. You can think of yourself as coordinating all those elements we talked about. That's a leader. But how you do that is leadership. And how you bring people together in a collaborative way is a social process. I know that sounds really weird. OK, is leadership, collaborative leadership is a social process that enables individuals to work together as a cohesive group to produce collective results. As an emergency manager, that's your job. And that's why you want to make sure you have those core four and you understand who's in those different groups, because your job is to bring people together for disaster response and disaster relief. And it's most effective, and, and this and most effective when it generates three critical outcomes, and that is direction, alignment, and commitment. So we come out and we understand where we're going, we understand how we're working together, and we are all about making it happen. This comes from uh, research that was done by the Center of Creative for Creative Leadership in 2008. I'm more than happy to provide you more information about this. Because when we started looking at this for emergency management, we realized that if you go back to those definitions and the vision and the mission, it really is all about integrating, coordinating, coping, and making 
the response happen. But usually you don't have all of the resources. So you will have to be the one that puts together the direction, alignment, and commitment that makes the disaster relief happen. Sorry. And in direction, what we're talking about here is agreement in the group on overall goals. And basically, this is where we're going, and this is what we're going to try and accomplish. And everyone agreeing on everyone agreeing on it. That's usually not the problem. I'm going to tell you, direction is not the problem with emergency response, okay? Because people want to put the fire out. People want to save the community. People want to relieve uh, the victims of flooding. This is the biggest challenge you'll have, and that is alignment. And that is not only coordinated work within the group and getting all those agencies to work together, but getting them to agree that it's the way they should work together. That the way we need to work together is aligned with the requirements of the response. The direction, hey, we're going to save the victims from flooding. The alignment piece, that's where you make your money as an emergency manager. That's where you create that social process and you build on those relationships so that you can build that alignment quickly and start that disaster response even faster. And then the, the last piece really isn't a problem either. A lot of times, everyone is very committed. And what's so funny is sometimes overcommitment is an enemy to alignment. <laughs> it is, I'm going to do this because I'm a fire guy, and that's what we do in fires. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, but this isn't on fire. We have a flood, and we have a different problem. And now we have a, a alignment issue, and we've got to work together on a different way we might be able to use you. Yeah, the commitment piece is something that all of you are demonstrating on this call and that you are already accepting mutual responsibility for the solution and that you're not going to put yourself above the solution, that you're going to be a part of the solution. One of the challenges you'll run into is uh, with commitment is volunteers because volunteers may show up with a lot of resources, but training may not be one of them. They may not be trained, but they brought, I don't know, 14 crates of water from two states over to help out. Very committed to providing water. Let them provide water, hand out water, but no, they're probably not going to go out and treat anybody in a triage or anything like that. So your role as emergency managers is to cre create that social process that generates direction, alignment, and commitment. And another way you can use this is a lot of fun is that you can sit there and if you have a challenge with a response or you have a challenge with a certain issue or a certain organization, you might say, you, all you do is break it down into this and say, okay, do we have a problem with direction? They, they weren't aligned with where we were going. Do we have a problem with commitment? They really wanted to have their own exercise or they wanted to do their own thing, didn't want to be with us. Or do we have an alignment issue and they just didn't understand where we were going? And another way you can look at this that is very easy that I use all the time is head, heart, and hands. Direction's all about the head. Are we all thinking the same way? Alignment is all about the hands. Are we all working together in a way that we can make things stronger than each of us is as an individual? And the commitment's all about the heart. Is this their heart in what we're doing and is the heart in where we're going in addressing this disaster response? So you've got all those agencies. You will have four key skills to create the social process that generates direction, alignment, and commitment and reinforces those relationships we talked about earlier. And that's the outcomes of leadership. Yeah. There is a question or, oops, someone else made a comment. Um, there was a comment in the chat. Oops, I just missed it. I'm over scrolling, so give me a second. Oh, sure. I'm scrolling back to it. You've got some great comments in here. Tim says, what is the best method you have used to realign a group, especially if it's time sensitive? Sorry, Timothy, I shortened your name. <laughs> hey, Timothy, thanks a lot. Um, if it's time sensitive and also if it, 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 it may be casualty sensitive, you need to get that out very quickly. And a lot of times people will blame other people and go, oh, you guys did not do this or you don't know what's going on. I'm going to offer a different perspective. And it might take a little bit more time, but you'll get a better response. And that is, hey, this is what I see happening right now, okay? This is what I see happening. And just use facts. 
this is what I see where we are right now. This person's going left, you're going right, you're going up the middle, no one's throwing the ball. Do I have that right? And stop right there. And all of a sudden people come back and go, oh man, you are so weird. Give us a minute, we're a soup sandwich. We need to fix this, okay? If you can get out of the blame game and get into providing open feedback by using facts, hey, everybody stop. This is what I'm seeing happening right now. Am I, am I seeing the same thing you're seeing? And in that way, it lowers the defensive mechanisms and gets people back on board, probably with where you need them because they recognize that you're watching. Um, Kyla, uh, Kyla, Kyla or Kyla, man, I'm sorry, I'm just massacring your name. Um, and mention the name of the book again, please. Sure. The name of the book is Kicking Some Glass by uh, Portia Mount. And uh, great, great book. Uh, the name of the book uh, for uh, the Center for Creative Leadership is DAC. And if you go to the Center for Creative Leadership, go to their website, they've got a ton of white papers about uh, direction, alignment, and commitment. Demetrio has a good comment here. Being a fire guy myself, the issue becomes when we respond to the incident first. Oh, man, we could have a long conversation, Demetrio. We natural feel, no, it, hey, Demetrio, that's not just you, dude. I'm, I'm telling you, if the police are there first, they want to take over. Why? Because they feel they have the best situational awareness. And you know what? Like the fire guys who show up first, they do tactically. But you know what? Strategically and operationally, they may not have the best view of what's going on two blocks away or how this is going to affect things over time. Natural to feel like we're in command until someone with higher authority assumes command. Well, under the incident command system, that could be the mayor. That could be the police commissioner. It could be. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we've had situations where the fire folks showed up and it was a sniper situation and he was shooting at fire people. That ended up with the commissioner of police as, as the incident commander. Um, and that's one of those things where you have to be self-aware and you have to know what the system is in order to address the situation you're in right there. And yeah, if, if it's time for you to step up, step up. And if it's time for you to be a part of the solution and be committed to that alignment, meeting that solution together, the best way you can lead is by being a hell of a follower. And by being a heck of a follower and working with those other teams, you're going to uh, basically resolve that disaster faster, better, stronger, and with a stronger uh, uh, media return than if I have a big ego because I happen to be the former military guy and I was a big commander when I was in the military and you're gonna do it my way. Um, I can tell you that doesn't work. <laughs> Just personal experience. And so, oh. Building on what you just said, um, Clemson started this with, you know, we met with me going through one of the hope exercises, learning self-awareness and learning that being the best leader can be a follower was a very hard lesson that he forced down my throat <laughs> at an exercise because I knew what I was doing and I should have been an incident command. And we were like a group of six. And I think everybody but me or everybody but like two people in our group got to be an incident command, not me. I was forced to be a follower, literally had the door shut in my face. I grumbled the entire weekend. I think I grumbled for months after that. <laughs> Looking back on it now, it has taught me there's a time and a place that I just need to sit back and watch and listen. But I was mad probably a good year after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that does happen. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and tell us, you know, tell us about the self-awareness you, you got out of that, Tim. Um, well, I've learned that I'm type A, <laughs> um, that I need to, you know, I do have to learn to teach myself to step back and just listen. And I may not always be, I may know what's going on and I may not agree with the way the situation is being run, but it may not need to be my perspective that needs to be heard at that moment. So I've had to learn to just kind of step back and let it all happen. And after everything's said and done, if my, if I feel that my comments or opinions can help the situation, then I'll go ahead and say something at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I just want to throw one thing out here is that, uh, and I've seen Tammy in this situation as well. Stop it. Just, if it's a safety situation, speak up immediately, <laughs> right away. 
And especially if it's a safety situation that you know is a safety situation and someone who might be an elected official incident commander may not know. And you want to speak up anytime it's a safety issue, anytime it's a life-threatening issue, anytime it's any type of issue that could create uh, more uh, casualties or victims. But other than that, knowing yourself and, and finding ways uh, to learn more about yourself. You know, I talk about this Red Bull assessment that's out there. There's a number of assessments about uh, core values that are online that are very good. Understanding that about yourself. Um, we have a joke in the leadership industry that if two people are in a conversation and one person is self-aware, 50% of that conversation can be under control. So if you know yourself and what's important to you, you can manage that effectively and you can leverage it in a positive way with someone when you're trying to influence them or you're trying to make something happen. So I just wanted to share those three things with you. I wanted to share those uh, that idea that first, the relationships with the different groups you're going to be working with are critical to emergency management because unlike, um, uh, unlike Demetrio, who's a fire guy and probably used to getting out there and making things happen, as an emergency manager, you're probably once removed from the actual tactical action. And it's a different set of leadership skills. And those leadership skills are really well defined when we talk about creating, reducing, integrating, coordinating, okay? And the way you do those effectively is by being self-aware, having learning agility, um, being able, being influential, being able to influence others, as well as being a very good communicator. And what when you use those skills effectively, you have that social process where you integrate those groups together and you can create the direction, alignment, and commitment to address that disaster challenge. So I'm gonna stop there. That's pretty much uh, what I had. And I'd love to get your questions. I think um, I can stay on for as long as you'd like to ask questions or have conversation. You can tell I'm very interested in this. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, and I want to thank you very much for uh, your interaction as well as your questions and insights. So let me hand it over to uh, Tammy and she can. Uh, yes. Uh, one thing I want to say, I know this is scheduled to end at eight. Like Clemson said, he's willing to go on longer if anybody has a bunch of questions that they need answered. Um, but before you go, please make sure that you follow Emergency Management Growth Initiative on LinkedIn. You can connect with myself or Clemson. We're both on LinkedIn. Uh, that's part of expanding your network and making sure that you know you can reach out to us. Um, if there's anybody else, you know, within the group here that you've you know seen some of the comments, might have similar interest in. I'm sure if you're not already on LinkedIn, I highly suggest it. Um, about a year and a half ago, I finally built out my LinkedIn profile, and it has been career changing for me. Um, Build literally. your LinkedIn profile. Yes. Build your LinkedIn profile. But it literally has been career changing for me because tomorrow marks the end of week two of my new job, um, and it's actually from my networks that I built on LinkedIn. Um, awesome. So definitely uh, go ahead, and, and if you don't have it, build it out. Uh, but yes, if there are any questions, you can raise your hand and you can ask audibly. You could type them in the chat. You could type them in the Q and A. Um, we'll hang out here as long as you guys have questions. Uh, oh, John has a question. John has a question. One second. All right, John, you're good to go. Of course, uh, being a paramedic, similar to the fire guy, and I totally understand about the different relationships people have. When I teach ACLS, Advanced Park Life Support, and I have to teach the doctors and nurses, and I'm just a a senior paramedic i'm actually a critical care paramedic and you tell them that they still have that auspice of like uh why are you teaching this stuff we're higher arc than you are and you're trying to form this relationship that to understand that yes this is what we do this we're trying to formulate just make sure you guys understand this all and i've gotten that down pat pretty well and i've got that formulation but i'm just thinking just the disaster just happened up in new york in new jersey oh, those yeah, guys were, those those guys were not ready for this i mean it's just something just it's unforeseen circumstances that happen how would you, and I think someone else talked about that time sensitive, how would you gather these people together to, to, to get one accord? Any ideas? Because you haven't really established a relationship saying, yes, we know this is going to happen. This is what we can do. That's great. But now this got put in 10th gear so fast, it made their heads fun. They're, they're talking about they were anticipating six foot water. Now they got 23 foot of water. Um, oh, yeah. And now, 
everything's it's just on the spin. So how would you uh, recommend or just an idea which way direction to go when something like that actually happens? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, um, as we like to say in the South, bless their heart. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, and, yeah. and, but it's also one of those times where, you know, we talk about, you know, this, everything I've talked about tonight, perfect scenario. And, and that's what we do when we talk in an academic situation. You know, real life, real world, there's times when you got to tell the guy to dig the ditch. And there's times when you got to step up and go, look, we're going to do it this way for three hours. And then we're going to have a meeting and we'll do the, all the collaboration stuff. But we've got to have an emergency response right now. And right now, you need to do X, you need to do Y, and you need to do Z. And, um, and if somebody doesn't want to do that, I'm, <laughs> So I'm from South Florida. I've seen a couple of interesting uh, emergency management uh, scenarios. <laughs> but my favorite one is uh, the emergency manager gets up there. The island has flooded. And he says, this is what we're going to do. And the fire chief goes, well, you know, I don't think that's what we're doing. I think we're doing this. And the guy looks right at me and says, you can leave. And thank oh. you. For your <laughs> you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the, the fire chief's like, what the? I, said, I don't have time for this. And we don't have time for this. We need to do it this way. Here's our protocols. We're following the protocol. Do this. And here's what I'm going to do. I gave you a hard time. Thanks for letting me do that. You and I are going to talk in about two hours. But we've got to contain this now. So there are times when you become authoritative. And it's easier if you built a relationship with that guy. Both okay. people had gone to high school together. They'd gone through emergency management school together. They knew each other. So when he was giving them a hard time, you know, he knew it was going to come around. So there's times when you get that additional, you know, 15 feet of water. And it's like, look, the book is out the window. This is what we need to do. And this is how we need to go forward. And that's a time where that self-awareness and being able to step up, being able to communicate and leverage those relationships becomes so important. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Something to add on to that is, um, well, A, build your LinkedIn profile and network there. Um, reach out to people. I mean, you can actually search on LinkedIn for professions or jobs similar to the ones you're interested in or you're doing. And I can tell you almost anybody in this career field, whether you know them or not, if you add them to your network, they'll accept you. And they may not know who you are. I have over 600 plus people, I think, through my network. I probably know 20 of them in person. Um, but they're part of my network. And you build those relationships, like we say, during blue sky events. So when we have the event, like the one, like I'm up here in Hershey, Pennsylvania, we got the rain before it hit tornadoes up in New York and New Jersey. So we have flooding right here that we're dealing with now. But um, when those events do happen, we have that network built out. It's someone that I may not have met in person, but we know names, we've had conversations and we know each other's strengths and weaknesses and abilities because we've built out that network. And it's a lot easier to sit there and go, well, I know that you're familiar with this. Those who know me know I'm from South Florida. When it comes to storm stuff, they all come to me because we don't see very many hurricanes and tropical storms up here. I've been through pretty much everything since Andrew. So <laughs> they go ahead and they turn to me for that. That's just a prime example of the importance of, of building that network. Yeah, and um, and going into the building network, there's some great stuff on chat here. Um, uh, in the process of finishing up the masters, want to find a mentor. Um, first, go on LinkedIn. Uh, another thing is, um, so um, I, I, um, I, when you're looking at relationships or you looking at networks, you want a network that is diverse, open, and deep. So. Um, you know, a part of my time, I'm, I'm an academic, and, um, you know, people come up to me and go, you know, where should I go? I go, hey, I know this guy. And even though, you know, I may not have the expertise you're looking for, this guy might, and I'll connect you. So the first step may be your professors, if you trust your professors and their they're, 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 they're folks. And usually most people who teach emergency management are pretty practical and pragmatic. The other thing that's really important about relationships, and I'm seeing it on the chat, which is just so exciting right now, is, is talking to each other 
because right now, um, you know, within emergency management, uh, a lot of senior EOC positions and EM positions in counties and states are usually filled by former chiefs of police, former fire departments, et cetera. That's actually going away. There's a trend within emergency management that is trending towards everybody who's on this call. And it's becoming more professionalized, which is why I enjoy being a part of it. It's becoming much more rigorous, which is why we're getting all these certifications to make sure that we understand the process and the protocols. And as you look at those uh, certifications, some organizations, I know IAEM has this, have lists of mentors that you can send a note to that certificate, that certifying agency, and they can link you up with someone as well. So start with who you know, start with uh, the people that are next to you, and then uh, the third way is to go to that uh, certifying uh, body. I think Ariel has, a, uh, has her hand up. Yes, uh, you are good to go, Ariel. Okay, can y'all hear me? We can. Okay, so I work in healthcare now, and I'm debating between emergency management and public preparedness. And so um, I've done a couple things where I'm taking FEMA courses and um, I'm waiting to hear back from my local cert to determine whether which way I'm going to go. But in regards to public preparedness, where are places I can learn resources or what route can I take to be effective in that? Because I'm seeing a lot um, significant deficit in certain communities in Colombia, And I'd like to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'd like to create a path that would facilitate me bridging that gap. And, and the public preparedness, that's not one we hear a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually that's wrapped into the umbrella of uh, EM or, uh, you know, emergency preparedness. Um, it's interesting that uh, what I've heard, and, and Tammy, I welcome your thoughts on this. What I've heard is that the public health field is an area that is really looking at preparedness, is in the public health field is do we, do we have the resources? Do we have the background? Do we have the planning to address, uh, you know, something like a pandemic. Um, that's what I've heard. But Tammy, I mean, uh, I haven't, I, I'm afraid the, the public preparedness is just not one of my strengths, but I'm going to look it up now. Um, so public preparedness kind of as a career is not really a standalone. Um, it, like you said, it's wrapped into now the fact that you already have a public health background, you have knowledge of the way the public health system works. Public health EM is a huge growing trend, um, even pre-pandemic. And I, it's not even just emergency management for pandemics. It's um, within hospital systems or you know the large medical organizations, you're talking their COOP plans, their continuity of operation plans. You're talking their uh, you know, mass casualty incidents, you're talking major hazmat, mass decons, those kind of plans, public health truly needs. Um, if you have a specific interest in a section of public health, that's where you start getting into your epidemiology and all that kind of stuff. And if that's where you have an interest in, you can go that way. Um, that would be my best way to go. Now, if you just want to separate yourself from public health, you're just done with it. And believe me, after the last 18 months or so, I completely get it. Um, as far as public preparedness goes, I would look into more along something like mitigation, start looking into hazard mitigation. Um, FEMA's finally catching on that that's something that if we put money into mitigation on the front end, we're going to not put so much money into response and recovery on the back end. Um, one of the big things, a couple years ago, I went to a national VOAD conference in DC and uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and a couple other organizations, like four different different topic panels. And there's one particular one, uh, Home Depot was talking about how they have a program, I think they call it like Community Warrior or something like that. And after an event, you can go, your emergency manager can go to this Community Warrior and say, hey, we have 12 houses that have flooded basements and they'll give you stuff to help you muck out the basements or whatever you need. Well, that's great. So I asked the question, well, let's say we're down in South Florida and someone needs some plywood. They just can't afford it to put up on their windows for the pending hurricane. Do you guys offer that? 
they're like, oh, we, we don't get grants for mitigation. So no, I'm like, well, wouldn't it be better to offer somebody a couple hundred dollars of plywood than to risk their windows being blown in, which is causing their roof to be blown off, which is now causing them to have to literally tear their house down to the studs and start over when you could have just donated a couple hundred dollars in plywood for mitigation up front. So as far as public preparedness goes, mitigation or continuity of operation plans would be your best bet. And um, Ariel, are, you're in Columbia, South Carolina, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so the state EOC is there, and I know that the state EOM um, is, is down, what is it, it's on State Street. I've been down there a couple of times. They're, they're, they're very willing to talk to people. And so if, you know, again, um, giving them a call and just saying, hey, I want to come in and talk to somebody about this, uh, I, I'm sure they'd be uh, open to that conversation. Okay, great. Because I didn't even like think about hazard mitigation. And I appreciate the way Tammy said it, because it's like, okay, ounce of prevention beats a pound of care. So I, I like the way that she said that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I may have seen a storm or two. <laughs> Other questions, comments? I like that everyone's connecting with their LinkedIn in the chat. That's great. See, we're building our networks. Absolutely critical. Anybody else? You can raise your hand. You can drop a question in chat. Looks like Christina has her hand up. I'll fix it in a second. I accidentally went to full screen and I lost everything. <laughs> I hate it when I do that. Oh. oh, Christina put her hand down. Here you go, Christina. Whenever you're ready. No, Christina, did you have a question or a comment? I'd love to hear any comments about, uh, you know, the little structure that we built tonight about going from uh, groups to your skills to creating that, um, that collaborative leadership piece. And welcome, any thoughts you have on that? She's unmuted. She might be having a microphone issues. Okay. And I think Camilo has a great comment here. Take FEMA courses. Oh yeah, if you can do it in person, that's great, but online counts as well. Oh yeah, Teresa. So, um, uh, so Teresa, we need to get you to uh, our next, uh, what we call Atlantic Hope, where we do, uh, we, we take disaster simulation one step further to humanitarian disasters. And we involve people from the diplomatic world and the political science world in negotiations and displaced persons. Uh, what else did we do, Tammy? Um, getting kidnapped. Um, what else did we do? <laughs> uh, Hush's negotiation. The easiest way to describe it is you are trying to negotiate safe passage for yourself and refugees in a country that's been under civil unrest that just went through a natural disaster and then because of the civil unrest, there's been a kidnapping on both sides. So now you have to also negotiate the exchange of the two hostages while still following international law. <laughs> and you've got like two and a half, three days to get it done. Oh, you, the world. You, can't, you, you can't update, you can't uh, uh, upset the national government or the rebels. You can't. No. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a very involved exercise. It's it's uh, we we've been told that it's it's without a doubt one of the most complex um, that is done at the uh, at at the non governmental level. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, John. Whenever you're ready, you can unmute. All right, uh, I had a quick question, and uh, Clemson, you probably understand this quite a bit, especially when you're being a leader, especially in the military, and I've done both sides. You have any other good points, and I know some people have told me, even as a, an instructor and as a preceptor, uh, sometimes I, come, I can come off as arrogant. Other people say, if we can step into you, you're more confident, 
and they just don't know you yet. And I know for people who may not have met me for the first time may feel that way versus those that know me says, no, he's very confident. He, he knows what he's doing. Uh, but how do you kind of make sure you don't come off arrogant to push people away, especially when you're dealing with a disaster or trying to get or trying to get people to understand what you're trying to push forward in your objective? Yeah. Um, so uh, two thoughts on that is, is, you know, how one of the things that the military does is it teaches you to take control of a situation. It does not teach you how to effectively manage that situation. <laughs> <laughs> true. Yes, true. Um, and that creates a level of, of confidence that may or may not be justified. And, uh, you know, I'm an older guy now, uh, but Tammy can tell you that, yeah, yeah, that, that when, when I was younger and everything else, it was, it, was, it was a lot like that. Two things just to think about is one, I hope you've seen it tonight a little bit, is I have a, 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 a very unique sense of humor. So I try not to take myself too seriously. I take what I do very seriously. Yes, and yes. They recognize that and they know that, hey, look, we're going to have a good time. We're just going to have a good time. The world is falling around, down around us. Um, <laughs> we were, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think my, 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 my second in charge has forgiven me yet. We, we, were in a dramatic, <laughs> we were in a dramatic situation one time. And I looked at him and there's not much you can do when certain things were happening. And I just looked at him and said, are we having fun yet? He goes, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny because everybody started laughing. It was like, okay, now we're going to get out of this. Um, and what, 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 what the humor does actually is it creates a different cognitive perspective. It, it's actually a, a breaching mechanism to shift people's mindset. And okay. I'm looking at you going, boy, that's pretty funny. And we're really human and we're going to get out of this. Yeah, we are. So let's take a deep breath and let's work our way through this. So humor, appropriate humor, mine usually isn't, um, but appropriate <laughs> humor is helpful. The other thing is tell people what to expect. So, hey, we're going to do this thing. And let me tell you a little bit about what you're going to see from me, X, Y, and Z. That's that, that's that self-awareness piece. And it sounds like, John, you're a very self-aware guy, as yeah. are you know, many of our participants tonight. So as we go through this, you're going to see me do this, this, and this. And here's why I'm like that. I'm mm. dedicated to quality. I'm dedicated to standard. I'm dedicated to making sure that when you walk out of whatever we're doing, you're going to be the best there is. And together, we're going to make that happen. All right. You know, Thank you. created that environment. Now that all they just have to do is walk into it. And, and then at the end, you joke, you go, so how bad was that? <laughs> <laughs> How bad really was it? You know, that, that Tim, right. Tim, 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 Tim could tell you some great stories from Atlantic Hope where, yeah, sometimes it was bad, but understanding why we were doing it and understanding why we might be uh, acting a certain way helps create a foundation for us to have an ongoing dialogue and not destroy the relationship. Is, is that make sense? Is that yes. Out? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. No, certainly. So, real world experience, Clemson's talking about how, you know, we, go through these simulated exercises, those that have been through the Atlantic Hope one for the international aid, one of the participants that same year that they completed Atlantic Hope went to Haiti during the, um, was after one of the, it was, wasn't the, yeah, it was the first it was, earthquake. Was it, was it the, the first, first earthquake? earthquake? Um, went there, was helping with relief efforts and was trying to get rice and food from the main port to some more outlying towns. And one of the security people would not let them through with this food because obviously they wanted it for their family and they used the negotiation skills and, and everything that they learned in the exercise to negotiate maybe a bag of rice falls off the truck as I drive through your checkpoint so I can get the rest of it to where I need to be. It may not be up and up, but it got the job done and it's just learning those different skills, um, you know, like yep. he said, alignment. They yep. both wanted the same thing. They both wanted to get the food. So we just had to kind of make sure we got them on the same path. Um, Clemson, there's a question from Ariel. Do you have a website for the organization that you work with? She would like the opportunity. Oh, Ariel, we would love to have you. So if you go to humanitariantraining.org, let me put that into chat, okay?
And the name of the organization, and I'm just going to put CHSE because we just got this really long name that had to incorporate both disaster training and humanitarian stuff. So that's why we're the consortium. And it's a group of uh, about, well, anywhere between 10 and 15 universities and medical schools and nursing schools and schools of international relations and diplomacy uh, that come together to, to put on these exercises. Um, and uh, I think the last, when we did Missouri Hope uh, before COVID, we had over 250 role players. We had, and, and uh, they do mass casualty, we do high stakes rescues, we do boat rescues. It's a tornado uh, scenario, uh, F5 tornado goes, to, and of course goes through a trailer park. So we have upturned trailers, we have some remarkably well melaged people. Um, I, I've just got to say for all you people who do uh, medicine as a profession, uh, especially nurses, the grosser, the better. I mean, we just had some really wicked stuff out there. And um, in addition to the role players, we had uh, participation from 16 different agencies in Northwest Missouri, uh, everything from the National Guard. That picture with the National Guardsman in it um, is from Missouri Hope and rescuing that victim. And uh, we had uh, fire departments, EMSs, hospitals. You didn't see the helicopter. We had a helicopter that was flying around that was evacuating casualties. Um, we had drones <laughs> and uh, we had to deconflict airspace between the drones and the helicopter. Talk about a, 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 an alignment issue. That was high adventure, but um, that's the kind of uh, simulation we do. The other thing is once you go into the simulation, like when Tammy went into Atlantic Hope, um, a lot of simulations because of cost only last four to eight hours. Okay, because they really can't pay people to stay for long periods of time. The simulations that we run our hope exercises are what we call fully immersive experiences. So when you go into the experience, you're in that experience for four days and you're with your team for four days. You live with them, you eat with them, you save people, you fight with them. Um, you, hope you get to eat? Or they get food now? Yes, yes, it, yeah, it's new. Uh, it, 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 you know, it's, it's the new stuff. We're, we've gone soft. But, uh, but yeah, it, it is a fully immersive experience. And uh, we're the only ones who do that uh, right now uh, outside of the government. Does anybody else have any questions or anything else? Give you a couple seconds to type sure. in case you're like me and a little slower. Oh, John oh, has another one. I'm just going to leave John up and he can just talk. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Oh, I think I hit it. No, I'll just say thank you, Tammy. I followed you for the last time from, uh, you did the, the when you left uh, Florida, uh, and I was just been following you, you uh, what you've been doing. So I really appreciate this and continue on. So uh, it's actually helped me grow a lot more. Just uh, everything I've been doing, not knowing I've been doing it, I've been doing it, and it's, it feels good. So I'm like this. I'm just waiting for the next big job to come in and to jump into this. So thank you again. Yeah, no problem. Um, I could say that we are. Um, as far as EMGI goes, our next adventure we're putting together, I'm kind of done. This was the last one of my panels. We did uh, two series, figured we'd wrap it up with Clemson. He's the, you know, save the best for last, <laughs> but- um, Most entertaining anyway. Uh, from here, we are trying to work on behind the scenes, finding ways to connect our members with, um, other emergency managers within the communities to help maybe review resumes uh, based on their specialties, have someone within the same specialty field you're looking to go into, review your resume, different uh, entities, different fields, uh, look at resumes very differently. Uh, I'm sure Clemson can tell you a federal application versus a private sector application is gonna look completely different and the resume they want is gonna be completely different. So we're working on ways to connect those. Uh, we're working on ways to try to maybe offer um, internships and volunteer experiences, how um, IAEM 
and some of the other organizations have, you know, the website where you can look for jobs or whatever else we're trying to post more of a volunteer or intern opportunities to help get your foot in the door. Um, so definitely uh, keep an eye out for our, our next step. There might be a, a little bit moment of silence while we work on some of these changes, but that should be coming up the pipeline soon. So. There was a question. Oops. So Christina says, I'm looking for resources as I'm just, just finishing my EM certification and my EMED certification. Not sure what kind of resources. Well, I'll tell you, IAEM is great. Um, the, uh, they, 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 they've got, uh, their website's kind of wonky, but uh, they've got a ton of resources there. Um, but I'm not sure what other type of resources. My best thing to say is um, find someone on LinkedIn, and, and I can't push LinkedIn enough, especially if you're trying to move up the professional ladder. Find someone on there who has the career path that you would like to get into, connect with them and ask them how they got their path. Find a few of them and ask them what their path looked like and how they got to where they're at now. You'll find A, no two people's path are alike. Um, if anybody was lucky enough to participate with the um, AEMO video with Mr. Fugate uh, last week, I think it was, uh, listening to him speak and his path to get to where he got. Now, I was fortunate enough to grow up in Florida while he was the state EM. As I got into the field more, he was head of FEMA at the time. Uh, he's one of the guys that, you know, I kind of look up to and I'm in awe of his career. Come to find out, he literally stumbled into it. He was a firefighter who was working on his degree uh, because he couldn't move up the chain without having some type of degree. So he was working on it, taking classes in EM, and they were like, hey, here's a project for you. Well, while he was working on his project, somebody from the state called him up and was like, hey, we're going to hand you this job. And he's like, uh, okay. He managed Florida for years and years. So the federal government calls him and they're like, hey, you have a meeting with such and such about a job. He's like, I'm not looking for a job. They're like, no, you have a meeting with this person about a job you're gonna take this job. He's like, okay, that would never happen today. You have to have a degree and 900 references and a whole 10 page bio and anything else you need to get into the field. And he's even admitted he'd never get the job today based on his experience at that time. Um, so everyone's background is different on how they got to where they're going. Um, like I said, mine was a very bumpy, windy path. Uh, it took me through three states, many years of volunteering, but I finally got my foot in the door. Um, so definitely just connect and ask all the questions that you can. Anything else comes in before we let them go for the night? No, thank you very much. And it's really been a, uh, a privilege to be with you this evening because like I said before, if you look at trends in emergency management, I'm talking to future emergency managers, more so than if you were coming out of the police department, fire department, or EMS. And so the questions you're getting tonight and the, and, and the thoughts you're having this evening are absolutely critical for moving the entire profession forward. I just wanna thank you for your professionalism and, and your, uh, your, your high standards. So thanks a lot, I appreciate it. I'm on LinkedIn, send me a note and we'll be in touch. Thank you everyone, have a good night. Thanks Tammy, great job. <laughs>